Welcome everyone to TDSU. Uh, my name is Jason Smith. I'm a loan officer here in the Woodland. So again, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, first of all, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to go through a home buyer seminar, um, answer pretty much every question that you may have throughout the home buyer process. A little bit about me. Um, been in the mortgage industry for about 20 years, so I've seen pretty much every scenario that, that we can run into. Okay. So uh, I want to introduce my partner, Joe Mark Robinson, and his wife, Kimberly. Okay, thank you all for coming out. So we're going to be on the real estate side of it. I'm a real estate broker. We own Kimberly and Brokerage, uh, our group realtors. I've been in the business about 14 years. She's been in about 10 years or so with me. Um, so again, we'll be talking about the real estate side of it, why Jason um, explained some of the lending questions, et cetera, for you. So. Okay. So what we're going to do, uh, we're going to go through this flow chart from beginning to end tonight. Some of these we'll spend a little more time on. Some of them we'll go through them a little quicker because there's not as much to talk about. Now, uh, in your folder on the left-hand side is the flow chart if you want to follow along. Um, we're going to go over a few more things that's, that's in the folder as well. Okay. So um, let me ask, first of all, um, anyone here a homeowner now or have been a homeowner? No? Yes, my God. Yes, we have one. Okay, awesome. So the rest of you have never bought a home, first time home buyer. Okay. So this seminar is going to be good for both. Okay, this is, this is not just for first time. Um, now, also, while we're here, if we have questions, um, let's get them out right away. And let's not wait to the end. Um, as you know, we're on Facebook Live. If you have any questions, um, let us know, and we'll go ahead and answer those questions as they come in. Um, this is for you, okay? This isn't for us, this is for you. So when you walk away from here, I wanna make sure that you don't have questions. Because if you do, we haven't done, done it right. Okay, so don't be afraid to ask any questions. Um, okay, so buy a home, you're gonna be nervous. You're gonna be excited. You're gonna be nervous, you're gonna be excited. A lot of emotion going on, okay? This home buying process has been designed and formulated and perfected over 50 plus years, so um, don't be nervous, okay? Uh, between the two of us, we can get you through the process. Be excited, okay? Because it's very exciting. Um, so we're going to start at what I call Mortgage 101, okay? So I'm going to start with just some mortgage things. Now, in your folder, on your left-hand side, uh, I believe left, right-hand side, you've got a flyer. It has some products, okay? <coughs> so what I want to tell you about, first of all, how mortgage industry in our nation works. So on the right-hand side, you see conventional and government. The, about 80% of all loans in the United States are what we call conventional or government insured loans. Okay, 80%. So what does that mean? Is that the conventional could be what's on there is Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, and then you have FHA and VA. We lenders, banks, credit unions, mortgage bankers, mortgage brokers, we just follow their rules and guidelines when we do. They're investors behind the scenes, okay? So that's the 80% piece. They're investors behind the scenes. You still uh, pay TDCU, we still service it, but they're behind the scenes <coughs> investors. Think about it, we don't have billions of dollars back in the safe to keep lending and lending and lending, right? So that's what keeps the industry moving along. So keep that in mind, about 80% of, of all mortgages are in that category. Now, what I wanna talk about as well is on the other side, on the left-hand side, those are TDECU in-house specialty loan programs that we offer and only we offer, okay? We mirror some of the guidelines and rules of the other ones, but they're products that might be for you. Might not be. What, what my responsibility is, is to, when we go through an application, we can talk about later, is to present uh, options to you. Options might be a conventional, might be an FHA, might not. It might be one of our TDEC in-house type loans, okay? So that's what my responsibility is through the process. So, any questions at this point? No one? Good, all right. So at that point, what I wanna start talking about is when you're buying a home, um, there's typically three outlays of funds needed to buy a home. One is down payment. So one is down payment, right? Now, back to the types of loan products, 
Some of them require 3%, 3.5%, 5%. Depends on the product. We offer some zero down payment loan products. Okay? So, so keep that in mind. Of the three, we can do zero down or the other ones as well. If that fits when I present options to you. Now, the second outlay of funds is what I, I say is uh, insurance. In fact, we have some insurance people here from TDCU that's going to go over quite a bit of uh, some things for you today as well. And so the second LA is insurance. Insurance policies are one year, unlike our automobiles are six months. So when we come to closing, we're paying for a um, year's worth of insurance at that time. So that's the second outlay. The third outlay of funds is what I call closing costs. Now, closing costs are about a dozen different smaller items that add up to closing costs. Now, um, so you know, that's hard to say a number. We're not going to talk numbers because everyone's scenario is going to be different today. Okay? If you want to talk numbers, we can meet afterwards, no problem. Now, so that's the three outlays. Now, down payment, insurance, closing costs. Okay? So um, keep that in mind. Now, I also want to talk about, and this is all just mortgage 101, trying to get people familiar with how a mortgage works. Um, any of you ever heard of PMI? I got one hand, two hands, okay. I, I know most of you have heard of PMI. It's called private mortgage insurance. Now, I'm referring back to the, the types of loan products that we have on that sheet. Um, PMI is just this. Most of us, and probably all of us, have financed a vehicle and had to carry full coverage car insurance, right? You can't carry liability because if you total out your car, the lender needs their portion of what you owe on the loan, right? So PMI is very similar to that. If, and I'm kind of using roundabout, um, on the conventional loan side, um, you know, the conventional loan, if you don't put 20% down, you're required to carry the PMI. And what that is, is, is um, if you total out your home, meaning unfortunately something happens and um, you get foreclosed on, the, the lender goes back to the insurance, the private mortgage insurance. So you're paying that insurance just like you did on your automobile. Now there's different types of PMIs and MIs, I don't want to go into all, all that as well, but just know that. Now, our product, um, if we're um, going through our TDC in-house, we don't, we don't require that. It's our loan, okay? So keep in mind, again, that um, if, if that works out in the scenarios after we visit, um, maybe we don't have PMI, and that can save quite a bit a month on your savings. So talking about that, I use my hands a lot. When you have a mortgage payment, one aspect of the payment could be that PMI depending on what loan you have, right? The other piece of it is paying back the loan, okay? Paying back the interest in the principal. The other piece is insurance. Um, we will uh, take the insurance divided by 12 and that's part of your payment and then the taxes on the home. So the taxes are taken divided by 12. So your payment consists of four pieces when you make a mortgage payment or three if we have, uh, don't have the PMI, okay? I know that's a lot. Um, I, I see some people making notes. There are some, some scratch pages on the folder in the back to make some notes if y'all wanna make some notes about this, okay? Um, so, we're only at start. <laughs> so, we're gonna get going uh, into pre-qualified now. Let's go there. Um, but before I do any questions yet, um, I don't want anyone to sit out there and wonder. What I've just been over. Okay. So pre qualified. Uh, we got three items that we're going to look at when we're going to pre qualify someone. One's going to be your credit, one's going to be your income, and one is going to be what we call your assets, your banking. Okay? So um, that being said, um, to get pre qualified, I suggest you start months in advance, three months, six months, maybe a year. Okay? Uh, doesn't hurt. Because, at least talk to me, talk to Joe Mark, because we're going to help you get to that point of buying a home, okay? This is a, a lifetime um, expenditure, probably the most you're ever going to spend. Um, we do this, we do this all day, every day. So we can help you to plan to get to that point with your goals and needs, okay? So start well in advance. Now, when we're going to start the pre-qualification process, we have several ways to do that. You can come in and meet me. Uh, we can send you an app. I can send you an app. You can do it online. 
uh, as well. And um, phone. You forgot about phone. That's the easiest one. Um, if we're going to send you a, a link or online, get with me so I can send it to you. Um, that way it's directly when it comes back, comes back to me. Now, some of the basic things on the pre-qualification, obviously we need name, address, date of birth, social. Uh, we're going to go over two years worth of address, uh, two years worth of employment. I'm going to stop on employment um, because when we get to employment, uh, I need to find out about income. What do we do? How are we paid? Are we salary? Are we hourly? Are we commissioned? Overtime. So, and I ask, I say that because every topic in mortgage kind of has a little rule or guideline we have to follow. We, we've seen it all, right? So, if we're overtime bonus commission, um, I have to figure out you know what we are able and not able to use. <coughs> Or 1099. Um, I don't know if anyone in here is 1099 income um, or on Facebook Live. Um, we can work with that. Now, what I want to say, there's a myth that you have to be on the current job for two years. It's wrong. It's so wrong. Okay? Um, it's a myth out there. I can, I can do, we can do, the industry can do someone that's been on their job with just an offer letter. Maybe you're a, a teacher or you're working in another field where they give you offer letters and you move into that. So, don't think you have to be in the current employment for two years. We want to know what you've been doing for two years, you know, but we don't, we don't necessarily have to be two years. Okay? Um, assets. So that's the third thing. Uh, checking, savings, 401k, stocks, bonds, future funds, any, any sort of assets. We're going to look at that. Uh, we also want to make sure you have funds for the member of my three, down payment if needed, closing costs, and uh, insurance. So we're going to look at the bank statements to be sure we have that. If not, um, don't, don't be afraid to, to talk to us and apply because we have, uh, again, without going into too much detail, there's ways um, where, where maybe the sellers can help. Joe Mark can talk about that a little bit later. Uh, we have some loan products where we can finance some of those closing costs. So real life example, I mean, I've had people buy a home for $500, $1,000, literally, okay? So don't think you need 10000 20000 in your bank account to buy a home. That's a myth. It's another myth. Okay? So um, we can work with those things. Okay? Um, so we're going to talk uh, credit. We're going to start to stay in credit for a little while. I think it's a pretty hot topic. It's one of the things that uh, hinders a lot of people from being able to buy a home. You know, a lot of people make good money. I just said I can work with people that maybe don't have a lot of savings yet. But credit... I don't have the magic wand to change what's out there on the credit report, okay? Now, um, show of hands, how many in here, if I were to ask you what is your credit score, could you tell me? Awesome. Awesome. Yep, Very perfect. Strong. Every single one of you uh, raised your hand. Now I'm going to say, um, you, uh, you don't need to answer this out loud, you probably got it from Credit Karma, you probably got it from your credit card statement, you may have. Um, gotten it from applying here for an auto loan or a credit card. But this is where um, another kind of myth or thing. You're going to go to Credit Karma, you're going to call me, Jason, I got this 680 credit score, I'm ready to buy a home. And I'm like, okay, 680 on Credit Karma isn't going to be a 680 what I get. Okay? And here's why. The, there's different score models that the three bureaus use when they're sending out credit scores. Credit Karma uses one that's more of a consumer driven. Credit cards, cars, mortgages, okay? So there's different models, and typically the karma is a little higher than what I'm gonna get, okay? So karma's a great thing, the credit cards are great, use them, it's a great indicator to see where you're going up and down. I use it, I use it all the time. I pull up my little credit card one, I'm like, yes, I got I have enough this month, and dang, and I went down, you know, and then next month. So use it, it's a great indicator. Um, so. But when we pull credit, it is, it is a mortgage tri-merge credit report. Kind of a big word. Don't need to know that, but that's what we do. Okay. Now, a um, little more on credit. A lot of these programs, we can work with some lower scores. Um, when you, you know, the higher the score, obviously, the better products and more options I can give you. But I tell everyone, if you're looking to buy a home six months to a year from now, let's, let's come in, let's sit down, let's look to credit. Let's make a plan, okay? Maybe we're going to pay down this account. Maybe we're going to have to go pay off the collection. I'm not a credit repair guy. You know, that's not what I do. I'm, I'm a professional mortgage loan officer. But I've seen tens of thousands of credit reports in my lifetime. 
Okay, so I, I should be able to offer some assistance at least. Um, there are some good agencies that can help. I don't recommend, I don't not recommend any. Um, check them out, there are some good ones out there too. They do charge, okay. But I encourage you, come in, let's talk, let's sit down, let's look through it. If we're not there today, I I'll tell you, we're not quite there yet today. Let's do this, this, and this, okay? So um, when I do run the credit, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to go through every line item with you so you understand it, okay? I don't want you leaving the phone or my office with any questions, never, no matter what we're doing, okay? Um, at that point, now I have your credit, I have your income, and I have your assets, right? Those are really the three things we look at to pre-qualify, so that's it, okay? <laughs> Um, at this stage, I calculate what's called a debt to income ratio. Anybody heard of debt to income ratio? Everyone probably has. DTI, we call it in my world. Um, so we're going to call it DTI because I can't say debt to income ratio. It's too many words. Okay? So the DTI, uh, I'm not going to go into how we calculate it, um, but I will say a couple things. Is we take gross income, not net. That's another myth. Some people come to me and say, well, I only bring home X amount of dollars a month. Well, let's look at what your gross income is. So we go off of gross income, not net. And it's just a calculation. We're gonna take all the debt, um, we're gonna take the new house payment that Bill Mark's showing you, and we're gonna take the taxes and the insurance, we're gonna add it all up and divide it in the income. And there's a certain ratio we have to be at. Again, I'm not gonna go into too many details of that tonight, okay? Um, we can later, for sure, come here if you have questions on that. Um, so now I have a debt to income ratio, everything works. I look at the products that we just went through earlier, conventional, FHA, TDECU in-house, and I'm gonna present you some options based on what we were able to do then, okay? And I will be able to hand you estimates that show closing costs, that show payments, that show rates, that show everything you're gonna to need to know. And that can be done literally in 20, 30 minutes, what I just talked about, okay? Um, and at that stage, um, I also issue a pre-qualification letter, which is your ticket to hand to Joe Mark, so you can go make those offers on the homes, okay? So, that being said, we are through that, and as you're handing your ticket to Joe Mark, he's going to take over. So, once you get pre-qualified, the next step is to kind of just start making a list of wants and needs of, you know, what you want with out of your home, essentially. So. Um, you know, that could be bedrooms, the size garage that you're looking for, the square footage, two-story, one-story. Do you want the master bedroom upstairs, downstairs? Do you want a corner lot? Do you want a cul-de-sac? All those different things that you want. Um, and that, that certainly helps you figure out. And it's, it's very important to basically go in a very similar order to this flow chart because if you start looking at wants and needs without the pre-approval, one of two things could happen. You could either find something that may be out of your comfort level as far as monthly payment, or you could waste two or three months' time looking at something down here when in reality your comfort level is a bit higher. So um, it's very important to get that part of it figured out first and then look at your wants and needs. And it's, it's, uh, if there's two buyers involved, if it's a husband and wife, if it's you know partners, whatever the situation is, it's important for you guys to all think about what do I want versus what does he or she want? Um, because it's not uncommon for people to not necessarily be on the same page, and then that makes our time that we spend together very interesting because we're doing this all the time and going all around trying to keep everybody happy. So um, it's important to figure out what everybody wants, and there may be some compromise and some massaging in there. Um, but that's definitely an important thing. Um, once you kind of know what you're looking for as far as you know size, shape, style, etc. Then you want to move into selecting a realtor. Um, you know, once you decide that you want to meet with either myself or Kimberly, we like to do an initial consultation. So at that time, we will talk about what you guys talked about as far as you know your needs and wants in a home. So what you know, what matters to you, what's important, etc. Um, I like to sit down for 20, 30, 40 minutes and just kind of go through. What it is you're looking for, what area, you know, we can do it one of two ways. Sometimes I'll draw a map out that has the, the main freeways on it, and I'll put a star where you work. We may put a dot where church is. We may put another circle where family is, and then we figure out the radius of how far do you want to be away from each of those things that you spend most of your time doing. 
Um, that helps us figure out the market area where you want to live. There's other things that play into that. If you have children, school districts could be a very big thing for you. Um, sporting events, hobbies, etc. So um, all those kind of go hand in hand. But it, it's very beneficial to do that on the initial consultation so that we really know what we're looking at. You know, sometimes people will call and they'll say, hey, I found this house. I want to go look at it. Can you meet me there in, in 30 minutes? Well, we don't really know what we're going to look at at that point. So it's, it's our time together will be much more enjoyable if we can do an initial consultation to figure out kind of what we want. Now, things do change. You can go through and say, I'm not buying a house unless it's four bedrooms. I've got to have a two and a half car garage. I want the corner lot, whatever else. And you may find something that's complete upside down, opposite of that. And when you walk in, you feel it and that's what you're going to buy. <coughs> Those things happen, but it does, um, it certainly helps to, to have a roadmap and a plan to get there. So um, Jason and I work together very well on establishing your qualification with your wants and needs so that we're all on the same page. So um, his and my relationship really helps your process go very, very smoothly, um, basically from the pre-approval to the closing. So it's important to get a team of individuals together that can help you out um, and make sure that it runs smoothly because if you get the left hand that's not talking to the right hand, um, you're spending an awful lot of money and, and you don't, uh, you want everybody on the same page for sure. So um, once you figure out your needs and wants, your approval, and you know we're ready to start beating the streets and looking for a home, we start narrowing things down. So when I take or Kimberly takes a buyer out to look at homes, I ask everybody, I don't care if it's the first house or the sixth one we've seen that day, I ask people to rate the home from a scale of one to 10. How did this home rate based on your needs or wants? And one to 10, this may be a six, five, this one may be an eight, whatever the case is. That's an exercise that gets the buyer thinking about what they're looking for, what they want. It, it helps you in your mind kind of weigh the different options out as far as you know, the first house, the second house, et cetera. Um, but it helps me narrow down your search. So obviously, you know, you don't always find a home the first day you go out. But if I can see how you're scoring things, I keep that in my notes as well. And then when I go back to the computer to revise the search for the next time that we go out, I can look and say, okay, well, this house had, you know, maybe it had the island kitchen, but the cabinets were white, and they rated it a five because they said they liked the darker wood cabinets. Whatever the scenario is, that helps me narrow down and make the best use of our time the next time we go out. Um, all of those things certainly play into um, making the, the process smoother for you. So once we once we find the home, and, and it's not uncommon for folks to say, you know what, I like this one, but this is my backup plan. You know, but this is the one we really want to go for. You know, we we have a it's a fairly active real estate market depending on price points how quick some of the homes are moving. So again, once we figure out what price point you want to be in, we'll have a conversation over that particular market and area that, that you're going to be in. Um, but it's important to have the, you know, have your plan, et cetera. So when we find the home that we want, we are going to talk about a lot of different things as far as making the offer on the home for you. So there's um, contracts nine pages long, First page is, is what most people consider the meat and the potatoes. It's got the price on it. So, um, but it's very important to realize that's only one aspect of the nine page contract. There's so much else that goes into it. So we're gonna talk about the price. What type of loan did you get approved for that you wanna use? How much is that down payment gonna be? Um, obviously do the math, figure out what you're gonna finance, then you'll know what your payment's gonna be. Um, there is, you select, um, We'll get down and talk about title later, but on the contract goes the title company where you're gonna close escrow at. Some of them have a little bit different fees than others. Um, they, most of them are very, very similar in cost, so it's not a huge difference to you. Again, that's important to rely on your professionals to pick that company that they work well with so that everything happens in a timely manner for you. Um, we'll work through that. I always try and encourage my buyers and ask for them in the negotiation to get a home warranty on the home for a year going in. So we put that in the contract. Depending on your financial status, some folks prefer to pay out of pocket for their closing costs um, because they may or may not want, they may want to finance the least amount as possible. Others say, hey, you know what, I'd rather retain some of that cash to have in savings or I'd rather buy some furniture. Whatever your scenario is, 
that's why it's beneficial for Jason and I to be on the same page because that, you know, when we're going in and negotiating through for you on your home, if I know on the front side, hey, they would rather retain three, four, five thousand dollars for their self, then I can massage the offer in a way to try and get the seller to help us with some of those concessions for you. Um, we pick a closing date, we pick possession date, so closing date needs to work for everybody. That's something that we, um, you know, needs to needs to be beneficial for you. It needs to work with the seller schedule. It needs to be in a timely manner to where Jason can get your documents done. Um, it doesn't do us much good if we go out and say we want to buy this house and we want to close in two weeks. It's probably going to take the, the lender 25, 30 days, give or take, maybe 35, depending on if there's any holidays, whatever else. So. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces to the contract that you want to make sure get negotiated for you uh, accurately. Um, once the offer is made, um, the pricing is based on comparables, so we'll run numbers on the home so that you're not overpaying. Um, and we don't want to, you know, everybody wants to get a good deal, and I'm, I'm all about that. But if we come in and we're down here and the numbers should be here, I'm going to want you to understand that. So if you miss out on the house, I don't want you coming back saying, hey, what happened? Well, this is what happened. The values are here, and we decided, you know, so we, we go through all that so that you know basically where you're at on getting the offer submitted. Um, and then, um, <clears throat> so we work through that. The closing date, price, um, closing costs, who pays for the survey, um, who pays for the title policy, all that goes into making the offer um, so you definitely want somebody that's educated in the industry, that's done this more than once, that can look out for your best interest on all of those things. Um, from there, um, contract negotiations, we're going to go back and forth. Um, when I submit an offer, I like to copy Jason on that initial email. So when it goes over to the listing agent, um, I copy him on it so he has a heads up. Hey, you know what, James just submitted this offer on this house right here. That triggers him to make an outbound call on your behalf to the listing agent and say, hey, just want to let you know, James is my client. We've been working together for a couple of months. He's approved for X number of dollars, etc." That simple phone call will go a very long way in your negotiations because if they have more than one offer, chances are the other loan officer is not going to take time to make that phone call and just give an introduction. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's a warm and fuzzy that you can't really put a price on. Um, that helps out a lot. I've, I've had a lot of contracts executed um, and home secured just for that one little step that, that we work together and, and do for you. So um, there's it's 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 nothing personal. It's a dance. You're going to negotiate. You're going to go back and forth. They may you know the seller may be stuck on the price. Maybe they want their kids to finish school or they don't want their kids to start school. You know, at that house, maybe depending on the time of year, whenever you're ready to go, um, there's just a lot of moving pieces that we negotiate through on your behalf. Sometimes folks want appliances. You know, what's what standard that goes in the home with the cell would be a built-in microwave, oven, dishwasher, uh, and cooktop for stove. The washing dryer and refrigerator belong to the current owner of the home. Um, so. That's something else that comes up in negotiations. What you know? Do you have your own, or do you need what's in place currently? Um, so you know, we, we certainly work through all of that. Um, once we get the negotiations done, um, then we move to execute a contract and earnest money. So it's important to know you're going to write a couple checks once we get the. Uh, and you may have something to chime in on this in a moment as well. Um, but once we get the contract executed, by law, we've got two days to get checks delivered. So there's usually going to be an option period. So I try and get my clients 10 days to do inspections, get quotes on insurance, check floodplains, whatever else that is a near and dear concern to you. You do that during the option period. We pay for that option period. It's usually $10, $15, $20 a day if it's a 10-day um, option period. You're going to pay $150, $200 bucks for it. It's a deposit. If you go through with purchasing the home, that gets credited back on the back side on your final closing statement. You also have earnest money, usually about 1% of the home. So if you're buying a $150,000 house, the seller and or their agent is going to expect to see about $1,500 put up for earnest money. So that check is written to the title company, which is 
a neutral third party, they hold it again as a deposit, and it goes towards your down payment, assuming it all works out and you proceed to close it. Um, there are different ways. I won't get into all the details. There's ways to get, so if you, if you go under contract and you put up the earnest money and the option fee and you decide you don't want to buy the home, you are going to lose the option fee. That's what it's for. That's compensation for the seller taking the home off the market. It's not a lot of money, but they get, do get something for their time. Um, the earnest money, there are several different ways that we can work through that as far as getting that back for you, depending on when you back out of the contract, whatever the scenario is. But that's something I, you know, we don't need to go into all the details on that, but there are, there are ways that we certainly can look out for you regarding that. Um, but just, just keep in mind, after you've done pre-approval, et cetera, some folks don't think they have to write a check at all until they go to closing. Um, but I just, I want you to be aware that you know, there is going to be a front side to that and a little bit of it needs to come up front. So, um, and you heard that money is credited when we do go to closing. So right. $1,500 and the $200 option, $1,700 has now come off your down payment or closing costs or insurance because um, we're going to go over closing a little bit later. But a lot of people ask that question. It is credited to right. at the end. Uh, I have a question for you. Um, as, as an agent, there's a, a myth that I hear from a lot of people. They don't want to get an agent. They want to do it themselves because they want to save money. Right. Right. So what's the answer to that one? Um, you know, there's going to be an agent involved, whether you realize it or not. Either it's the listing agent that gets tied up and does both sides of it, um, or you bring one of us involved. You're not – it's a myth that you're going to get a better deal without an agent. Um, it's in your best interest to get a buyer's agent that looks out for your interest. Um, the listing agent has a fiduciary responsibility to look out for the best interest of the seller. Um, Who pays? The seller covers the cost. Right, of, that's so true. that's and that's <clears throat> actually the listing agent pays, but that's a whole different. Right, you know, it is what it is. So it's not. It's not a. Um, sometimes there's. A very minimal fee that comes out for like stores and prep of documents or whatever else, but it's, it's there's really overall there's no real cost to you to bring a buyer's agent to the table. Right. Um, if if you don't bring a buyer's agent and you go off of the you know if you just call off the sign whatever else the scenario is, um, you're not. I mean, you know, if you don't have a real estate license, they can't necessarily give you a credit back. I mean, they can't say, hey, here's X number of dollars because you didn't use an agent. Um, there's laws that prevent that, so it's, in, it's definitely in your best interest to have a buyer's agent look out for you, for sure. We have a question on Facebook. Um, how long is the pre-qualification good for? Okay, so I'm going to answer it in two parts. Pre-qualification letter um, is good for 30 days, and the, and the credit report is good for 120 days. So what happens in that 30-day time frame, uh, just after that, the update is just this. Are you still employed at the same place? Mm-hmm. You still have the same assets? Mm-hmm. Okay. And we're good. I issue another one. Okay? Thank you. Okay. So once we move, you know, once we get the contract executed, so an executed contract basically means all parties involved have signed the contract. So a lot of people have another myth is, hey, we, we're buying that house because we submitted an offer on it. It's not quite that easy have to work through it, whatever else, that home is still available on the market until the seller has signed your offer. Um, a lot of times, you know, a very good agent for you, we do a lot of times, we'll put in a deadline that that offer is good for. Um, sometimes, depending on the market, it's 24 hours, sometimes it's 72 hours, um, but you don't, you don't want to place an offer on a home without some sort of a deadline on it because they could sit on it for a week and see if something else better comes in. Meanwhile, you're thinking you have a home and the clock's ticking for when you need to be in a home because maybe your lease is expiring, maybe the current home you have is under contract, whatever the case is. Um, so it's not, uh, the home's not secured until everybody has signed the contract. So, and that's when your option period starts counting, that's the execution date, that's when the earnest money checks and all those things are, that's when the process gets moving. So um, we talked about the option period, the earnest money. The other expense that you would have on the front side would be for inspections. Um, we always, um, we, I always advise everybody, even if it's a brand new home, to get an inspection done. Um, the inspector checks for electrical items, plumbing items, 
um, HVAC, air conditioner, heater, um, they look at the roof, etc. They do not really inspect for cosmetic things, so if there is a crayon mark on the wall, if that's not really their job, they expect you would see that when you were looking at the home. Um, they don't pick up furniture and see if there's a stain under the bed or under the couch. Um, they're checking for the mechanics of the home to make sure that it works for you. Um, one thing to keep in mind, they are licensed by the state. They have certainly had their training, um, but they can't see inside the walls. I mean, they can do the best they can, um, but it's, it's definitely, you know, even if, even if you get a list of items from an inspector and you say, I still want to buy the house, I'm not going to ask for any repairs, this is the home that I want, you still have a honeydew list for a prioritized list of what you may want to address over time. So either way, it's, it's definitely a good thing to do as far as getting the inspection done. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, once the, again, I like to do it where the loan officer knows over here that the offer's been submitted, but once it's executed, that's the first thing that I do when I get the contract back from the listing agent is I say, okay, this is executed. We scan everything in. It gets sent out to the title company right away for them to start their process, and then it goes to the loan officer, and that's really what starts the timing as far as getting everything done for you so that you can go to closing on time and get things taken care of. So that pretty much brings us right here to loan application disclosures and loan estimate, right? Yep. Okay. So so as Joe Mark mentioned, a contract comes to me executed. So now this is where this becomes a real live mortgage application for regulatory purposes, okay? Remember, pre-qualified, now we're on application. So what this is, is that there's some disclosures I'm gonna send out to you um, through DocuSign, real quick, easy signature, um, in that as well as what's called a loan estimate. These documents are regula regulated, um, all lenders have the same documents, most of them other are the same. And the loan estimate has the nuts and bolts, the numbers. Okay, you're gonna see all the numbers that we've been talking about back in pre-qualified stage, okay? And all the numbers that Joe Mark went through, but now it's real official live loan application, okay? So um, once those come back to me, um, we're gonna go kind of quick here at these back ones because a lot of this is more just um, kind of formality things. So loan application is gonna come back. I submit it into loan processing and underwriting. So. If you all want to um, write on your, write under their own underwriting as well. Because it's very important. I mean, we got to know if we're going to get approved, right? So um, our loans go right into underwriting. They come out 24 hours, 48 hours max. Um, now keep in mind, I pre-qualified you. Um, as long as nothing's changed, we'll be fine, okay? Um, one thing you want to do then at that point, all loans come out of underwriting conditionally approved. Myth, some people think, okay, get approved, ready to go. No, we're conditionally approved. Conditions might be simple as appraisal, title, homeowner's insurance. Um, maybe we need a check stub, maybe we need a W-2, something minor like that. Um, but don't get uh, excited yet. We can't get excited until we're moving in or we get the loan approval, okay? so. Uh, loans come out conditionally approved. Um, this appraisal was also ordered at the time of, of submission. So appraisal, we'll probably both talk a little bit about that. I ordered the appraisal. Um, the appraiser is going to contact the listing agent. So that's where I'll have Joe Mark kind of talk a little bit about that. But what the appraisal does is um, gives us value. Okay, what what is the value to this property? You mentioned earlier that when you made your offer. He had gone in and found other homes that had sold look close by that looked like your home, that were close to your home in proximity. Um, this appraiser is going in depth in looking at those comparable sales, and then they'll come back with the value. They look very lightly on the condition of the home, unless it's something major with a hole in the ceiling or cracks in the foundation or something, but your inspector had already gone through and done the inspection. So some people think an appraisal is an inspection. It's not, it's just a value, okay? Um, they're also licensed. They've gone to class, school. They're, they've done lots, lots of these, thousands of these. So when they contact the listing agent, what do they do on your So end? when they go through for the appraisal, they call, they're basically setting up an appointment similar to what we did when we went and looked at the home. So they call and say they, they're not the best at giving a huge amount of notice. 
Um, it's very common for them to call. At, so I'm, I'm, I learned this from having listings because we do both sides. Um, it's it's not uncommon for them to call at 8:30 in the morning and say, "Hey, I'm going to be over by you know research force at 11 a.m. Can I get in?" Well, we'll see. <laughs> Usually that works unless somebody's at work and the dog's in the house or you know kids home sick, whatever the case is. But we try and get them in there as quick as we can. So when the appraiser goes out, um, again, they're not they're not looking for functionality. They're they're going in. They they measure the house to verify the square footage. They normally take a photo or two of the outside. They take a photo or two of the so the front yard, the backyard, looking at the house. They have to get a picture of all the appliances and all the bathrooms in the home. So basically, what they're doing is they're proving to the underwriter one the value of the home is there. And they're also proving that it's suitable housing so you can move in right away and you're not, unless you're getting a loan for a something that's a project, they have to prove that the home is ready to be occupied day one, basically. That's what they do. So one other thing, um, it normally takes seven, 10 days to get the timing typically on the Correct. appraisal. And that's, an out, that's a third party um, typically that does the appraisals. Correct. Um, and I want it on loan processing, just back up real quick and add something to that. Um, when we were talking about, um, you know, the process and the underwriter coming back and asking for clarification, different things, um, guys don't take that personally. That's <laughs> their that's their job. They're double checking everything else. Um, it's one of those things. It's not it's not Jason's fault. He didn't miss anything. It's not it's not my fault. It's they're just doing their job. And I hear I hear things all the time where somebody says, "I can't believe they didn't ask my shoe size." You know, they ask me everything else. They didn't. That's, you gotta understand, that's their job. They're, they're double checking, they're verifying things, et cetera. Um, a lot of times it's a real simple thing. Hey, this file went in, you know, three or four weeks ago. How about an updated pay stub? You know, it's not, if they come back with two or three things, take that as a blessing, that's all they're asking for, and just get it to them as quick as you can and, and move on, so. Um. And we have a couple of questions on Facebook as well. Um, the first one's from Yvonne. Um, what are some recommendations for when you may be going up against several other offers on the home? So, um, good question. Certainly, it, it all depends on depends on the price point of the home, the area, situation, etc. Um, I advise a lot of my clients sometimes to, you know, like I said, I'll, the loan officer will go a very long way if, if he calls in and, and basically just gives an introduction for you. That helps out a lot. Um, I've had folks write little warm and fuzzy letters that say, hey, we love this house because grandma lives two streets over, um, you know, trying to keep the daughter in the same school, whatever the case is. If you can find a way to emotionally connect with the seller, sometimes that helps. Sometimes it comes down to their bottom dollar. Um, so you have, to, you have to rely that, um, you know, that we're doing a good job for you as your agent and getting that presented the best way we can. So, awesome. And then uh, one more also from you, Vaughn. What is the difference between an FHA and a conventional mortgage, and which would you recommend for the buyer to see? Okay, so FHA is a government insured loan. So FHA insures the loan. Remember, we'll be talking about PMI, private mortgage insurance. FHA is really the insurer of that product. It, they do have a different set of guidelines than conventional. Um, so, again, when I pre qualified you, does it work? If it works, I would be presenting that offer. Uh, conventional loan, you know, again, different set of guidelines, different set of uh, private mortgage insurance. Um, you know, is one better than the other? You know, I, I can't say that. It's going to be buyer specific. Um, so there's really not one better. It's kind of like if the shoe fits, that's the shoe that's going to fit. Okay. All right, good. Um, any more questions? Anything from the audience? We're doing a great job. So, we're done with appraisal? Yep. Okay. Title policy, we're going to kind of skip through that pretty quick. Um, this title company is doing the uh, behind scenes check on the, on the property, make sure there's no uh, liens from maybe the seller, maybe something um, way back in, in history on the, that property. I think it was title kind of to a car, title to the property. Their job is to go back and do some uh, research on that. And what they do is um, once you're all closed, they issue an actual insurance policy as a, as a homeowner, and you'll want to keep that as well. But um, we don't really go a lot into that if you have something to add to title. Yeah, I mean, it's, so it's, 
That's basically your protection as a homeowner. Um, so they, they run a search to see if there's any um, any liens that are on the property get satisfied with the proceeds of closing. It's basically the overall summary of what the title policy is for. Um, every now and then they find some interesting things that is a very, very good thing. Um, so it's, it's definitely, it's definitely, um, it's definitely money well spent. Normally the seller covers the title policy uh, because they want to ensure to you that you're buying the home free and clear and there's not any, any skeleton in the closet per se that are going to come back at you. So um, it's a good thing to do. All right. Yes. Um, oh, yes, sir. Assuming there is something wrong with the title, um, and it clearly changes our uh, desire to want to buy the house. Uh, something pops up, we're not happy with it, we want to end the process. What penalties would that be on the buyer? So Facebook, the question that he has is, if something comes up on title, uh, we call it clouded title, that maybe as the buyer uh, that you, you don't want to buy the home, okay? I think you could probably answer that so one. That it's hard to answer that. It's going to be situational specific for sure. sure. Um, I, the most interesting thing that I've seen in 14 years is I had a house that was um, supposed to be owned free and clear. And the seller was obviously expecting, you know, they're only going to take a week. They paid the mortgage off. They've been there a very long time. Um, but what actually happened is somebody did a typo, same street number, but different street, and tied a new mortgage to that house. Um, so it got very interesting. It took about, a, it was about a two week delay. Um, and obviously they got it resolved with, you know, attorney's help, et cetera, and got the deed moved around and fixed, whatever else. I'm not real sure what would, yeah. I, I can't think of an example well, as far as something that would cloud it that would make you not want to buy it. Because right. again, if they can't, if they can't resolve that cloud, they won't issue the title policy and then there's not a deal to be had anyway. Yeah, so. the title policy would keep you insured going forward right. in time to resell it. And it's, I have, I can't think of any example ever that a title uh, search caused a issue to not buy. The we, title company can fi fix it, figure it out, go back in time. Sometimes they go back to the owner of the home and get their title policy. And then that allows the yeah. new title company right. to insure your purchase. Okay? It's insurance. So, yes, there, there's ways around it almost every time. Okay? All right, anything else prior to this? Because if not, I want to turn it over to the insurance. Anyone? Okay, come on. Jason, Jim Mark, thank you for all your You're information. Um, I'm Brian, this is my coworker, Jan. We work for QDECU Insurance Agency. Uh, the insurance agency is an independent insurance agency. Uh, we have multiple carriers uh, that we shop your insurance for uh, to help you find uh, the best coverage at the best price. Uh, one of the things that is important to know about homeowners insurance is that the value that we insure your home for, it may be different from the value that you buy the house for. Okay, because we insure on the replacement cost that includes the cost to remove debris and rebuild building codes and stuff like that. Uh, so that's some things that, that, that we look at. Um, we have uh, seasoned agents, like all the agents within our organization have 10 plus years experience. Uh, so that's going to be a little different from dealing with a uh, state farm or an all state where you might talk to somebody that's young in business. We're all seasoned agents. Um, we have a service team. Our service team, what they do for you is you'll buy the home and then let's say you want to do some remodeling to it, right? It's going to increase the value of the home. So our service agents look at the six month mark at doing a midterm policy review that helps you to look at the, the uh, changes that you may have made to the home and maybe we need to increase coverage. Um, well, the ease of doing business. Okay, so because we are TDECU, it's a very smooth transaction to move from the mortgage department down to the mortgage servicing department, down to the insurance department, and then back to the uh, to the mortgage 
uh, servicing department would send the uh, insurance for you. Uh, let's see. Now, there's several different types of policies. Okay, so in homeowner's insurance, it's not all the same. You're going to run across some uh, folks that may offer you a low price and some that may offer you a very high price. But what you need to look at is the coverages. There's different types of policies out there. There's a uh, named feral policy, for example. It's very limited in coverage. It covers maybe 16 things and up to it. What we write is the open perils coverage that covers everything that may happen to your home except for what we exclude. And generally, that's going to be earthquakes, floods, uh, war and terror, and neglect. So, uh, Sam, you have no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just that, you know, we do a broad coverage policy, so when you're looking at those policies, don't just look at the premiums. You're looking at that, how much you're being insured for the loan amount, make sure that you're insured for replacement costs. You want to look at those deductibles. Um, somebody may be giving you a really, really high deductible, you may have a 5% win and hail deductible, and somebody else may give you a 1% or a 2% and save you about four. I mean, it may cost you some more money, and the other guy's saving you a lot of money, but what are you going to put out of pocket if you have to have a plan? So you really want to sit down and look at those policies side by side of what somebody's giving you quote on this and everything. Um, you want to make sure those policies have water backup, water damage coverage. Um, you've got liability coverage for somebody gets hurt on your property, medical payments, things like that. You want, if you're going to have a dog there, you want to make sure that you've got coverage for that dog who's not excluded, um, depending on where. You know, you have a trampoline. Things like that. If you're going to have a pool, you want to make sure those carriers will ensure you that you're getting with and everything. So, um, so it's just you just if you don't really know your policy and you're just not sure and you have an agent that you're working with on insurance that you like better than somebody else and you've got quotes, let them look at them and compare them and tell you what's the, the best thing to do. With us, that's what we do. We we consult with you. We tell you exactly and go over um, side by side and make sure that you understand exactly what you're buying and what you're getting. Um, so. If somebody's offering you a better rate, there must be something that, I mean, I didn't say they're not going to give you a better rate, but uh, if they're offering you something too good to be true for price wise, there's something that's probably missing that you can take and offer it. So. Uh, ma'am, in the purple shirt here. Mm -hmm. Hi. That ring's very nice. Can I see it? Is it a ring? Yeah. Yeah, it's a nice ring. You know, that brings up the point about jewelry. Jewelry on um, homeowner's policy don't cover it. They have to $1,500. So some folks have more expensive items than that. And what we need to do when you have an expensive piece of jewelry is we have to schedule that. So what scheduling means is that we get a description and appraisal of the jewelry, and we add a rider onto the policy that covers that specifically. So that way you're not limited in your coverage. As long as all repairs have been made to the home, yeah. you do have to pass another inspection on the insurance side too. Mm -hmm. So those have a good we'll Questions regarding homeowners insurance. Mm -hmm. All right. So also too, we don't just write. We write. You know, we can write your primary home. We can write your secondary home. We can write your rental property. Um, some landlord policies, anything like that that you're looking for. Um, we write any kind of insurance that you could do. We do um, homeowners auto. We can try to bundle. We can look for those best rates. We'll do flood <coughs> insurance. Um, if you're buying on the coast, if we can either. Um, include the wind in the policy if it's eligible, or if we have it um, separated out, we'll do a separate wind policy for you. Um, what else is on the there? Water damage so, endorsement. Um, oh, water damage endorsement. You guys, uh, when I was talking about different homeowner's policies, there's some homeowner's policies out there that cover water, but only if it's a sudden accidental burst of, of pipes. Our policies will cover slow leaks, so something that may be behind the wall that you don't see, and you don't notice a spot. You know, on the ceiling or on the wall, um, maybe on the carpet, 
it's not something that just burst. It just has happened over time. Uh, we endorse our policies to cover the what we call seepage or, or soil leaks as well. So I'll send you a your little bag. There's a little travel quick for information sheet that says about how much all the general information to come in. Well, just little guidelines to tell me about things are not equal and some things to look for when you're looking at it. So um, that can help you if you remember. So you also, I like when y'all they do those inspections and they're looking at it. Um, when you're coming back, your agents going to want to know about things about the updates to the home, about the plumbing, the heating, things like those. Those are things that you're also going to want to make sure that you ask. That's your right to know on that home you're buying it when something was updated to put in there. So you, you know, if it wasn't disclosed, that you're going to really start to ask that to them. So they should be able to tell you that. Um, if there's an elevation certificate on that home, you're buying a home that needs that, we're going to need a copy of that. They should be able to send that over if they have it. So you're really just to help get that out for us. Um, and then we also have our other group here, Life Insurance, to help you cover that mortgage. This is Rusty. How you doing? This is my partner, Robin Bowe. And um, we work down in Houston, but uh, not a far from up there. Appreciate you having us out. So, uh, you and the one, right? Talking about life insurance. The only insurance that's not required to have a loan. But it's just as important as any other insurance. Like title insurance, and homeowner's insurance, car insurance, and all those. If something happens to the breadwinner or breadwinners of a house, and your, your family's nice and, you know, seated into that house, your kids are in school, and something happens to a breadwinner, and you don't have enough life insurance, guys, it's one of the most traumatic things you have to deal with. And I've seen it in my years of the business, about 30 years, it's, it's really hard. So when you're figuring out what it's gonna to cost to be in a home, your life insurance needs to, be, needs to be part of that. And we have one person, I think she, she says she's had a, a home before, so she probably got a thing in the mail. I say one, she probably got 25 or 30 pieces of mail saying mortgage cancellation insurance, right? And it simply means that if something happens to you, uh, and it can help pay the house off or pay the house off, okay? It's really just life insurance. And I want to point something out about the difference of that. Uh, most of you guys probably have a job, or your spouses do, and you have group insurance at work, right? That's called group life. It's real cheap. Most of the time, they don't even ask any questions. But the problem with that is, if you use that as your basis of taking care of your responsibilities financially, you really have a, a, a sandy base, because it can go away in one day. You could lose your job, they could change insurance companies, and they could also just say, we're not going to give you anymore. We're not going to provide insurance anymore. Or you don't buy it in the first place because your HR department didn't tell you about it. Or you missed out on open enrollment, all kinds of things. Usually when it comes to insurance and the worst kind of the life insurance or disability, you have a claim and you don't have the coverage. So when you're thinking about insurances, think about life insurance and don't think about it only as mortgage cancellation. It's really insuring you. Okay? If you have a house insured and you're in the house and the tornado comes through, house gets damaged pretty bad, but it takes you out as well, you get a double whammy there, don't you? So you got to think about life insurance. There's many kinds of life insurance we provide, and since we are part of TVECU on the insurance, we have multiple companies. So we're not tied to any insurance company. We're here for you. It's all about educating you first. Because if you just go out and buy a life insurance policy, guys, you may be the wrong kind, you may buy the, the wrong amount, and you may think you're covered for some things you're not. And it's insuring you, so we're looking at you. We're not looking at the house. We're looking at you. So while you're healthy, while you're young, that's the time to buy it. Uh, and so I tell you that because most of my clients have gotten into their homes. They've been there four or five years. And then, then they start thinking. After they settle in, they're going, gee whiz, man, this is a nice place. I sure would like the family to stay here if something happened to me. You know, as a dad and stuff like that, I've always thought about that. So being in the business, I carry a lot of life insurance naturally, right? But a lot of people do not even think about it. Why? Because it's a doom and gloom thing. I mean, you've heard the saying, you're going to do two things in life. You're going to die and you're going to pay taxes. Well, life insurance covers both of those. Okay? You have a big tax bill when you die. You know, you got tax-free money coming into the, into the household to take care of it. It takes care of mortgages, education, all kinds of things. So it's not just for mortgages. So when you, when you sit with an agent, when you sit with one of our agents, Okay, like I said, we're independent, so we don't have a dog in the fight when it comes to the company or the type. But you sit with an agent. Get educated on your life insurance. Make sure it's the right kind, the right amount, and the right price. It fits your budget, things like that. <coughs> Excuse me. So I wanted to go to what the real estate gentleman said about uh, writing a letter real quick just to wrap up. 
because I don't like talking about pet too much, okay? But our granddaughter, we bought a house in, in uh, Cyprus four years ago, and there was four bids on the house. And our granddaughter wrote a letter to the, to the seller and said, please sell the house to my grandparents. That they'll only live one mile away. The guy called us that night and said, we're going to sell the house to you. Okay? So that, it, it, there's something emotional about that, right? There's a lot of stuff emotional about life insurance, too. Uh, don't get too tied up in that emotion is the point. Have someone educate you. Buy the right time. Buy the right amount. And when you get those letters in the mail after buying a house, you know, try to know someone in the insurance business prior to that even happening. Because you're going to be looking at that and you're not going to know anything about it. Educate yourself first. We'll walk you through it. Uh, we do a lot of stuff online and on the telephone, internet, what have you. Uh, deal with someone you talk to. Okay? And that's what we're here for. Educate you first and then have you get the right product. That in mind, if there's any questions about life insurance, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, otherwise, if you have business cards over there, you can always call us up. Talk to us later with any questions you have. And appreciate you coming out tonight. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so um, keep in mind we're going through our flow. Uh, we came out of underwriting as a conditional approval. So we're waiting for appraisal, waiting for title work. You have selected your insurance, hopefully with TDCU. And then you're getting the quote or the contact information into, uh, into your loan processor. Because your uh, loan processor is working hand in hand with this underwriter to get us to this loan approval stage. Okay. Um, I'm here all the way to the end of the process, but really once I submit it into the loan processing, they take it and run here at TDCU. Okay. And again, they get it to there. So now um, once we're th in, through appraisal and title, again, insurance is kind of in, working all in there. Um, survey. We're going to cover that real quick. Um, a survey um, is something else some people feel like might be appraisal, might be inspection, but uh, the survey... Um, first of all, the seller may have the survey from when they bought the home. Okay, um, if they do, then Joe Mark will have uh, will know that, and that will be sent in to title when the contract goes in, typically around that time frame. Title will review the survey if it's good or done. Okay, now so what is a survey? Uh, most of you may know what that is, but it's kind of a drawing. It's a little drawing of the road and the house. What we have to make sure is that your home is on your property because not in some divisions we don't see it so much, but you get out in some country areas, seeing some houses on someone else's land, literally, or a, a garage or a barn or something. Survey is very, very important um, part of the process. Okay, uh, If we need a new survey, let's say the seller doesn't have one, they lost it, maybe they put a pool in and built a garage and a shed. So the old survey is not probably going to be able to be used because we don't know if the pool or the garage and the shed is on your new property. So a survey uh, will be ordered later in the process after we know everything else is going on. Normally the title company will order that um, on your behalf. And the reason the title company might do that is Joe Mark and I have been talking about you know, working with people that uh, have done this for quite some time. So like the title company might have four, five, six different survey companies that they've done business with over many, many years and know their turnaround time and get it in and can get it accurate, okay? And obviously a good, good price for us, okay? Um, once all those things are in, your loan processor packages it all up, literally, emails it back in to that underwriter, 24, 48 hours, this is where you can celebrate. We got a loan approval. Clear to close, ready to go. Um, not done yet. We still haven't closed, but that's a big milestone, getting through loan approval. Okay. Um, at that stage, we at TDCU will actually, um, our underwriters, unlike um, what I've seen in my past, is that they will actually email the agents, let them know, clear to close. Why? Because they schedule the closing, and you can kind of talk about that piece. So um, <clears throat> once the loan's approved, everything else they have, um, Jason Mortgage Industry has a 72-hour disclosure. So they have to disclose everything to you three days before closing. So if there's a delay somewhere, once you're, so the clear to close is, is the golden words that we all want to hear. Once we're told that, if we get that on Tuesday, we can close on Friday. 
get that on Thursday, you're looking at Monday. So that's government regulations, nothing we right. can do about that. And once it's finalized, disclosed to you, we can close three days after. Mm -hmm. um, scheduling the closing, we try and do it as close as we can to the date in the contract. Every now and then, we finish a few days early and the seller's out of the way so we can close early. Um, and it's not, uh, it's not necessarily anybody's fault, but it's not uncommon for the closing to take place a day or two after the initially intended date. Um, things come up, delays happen, sometimes it's the survey. Um, most title companies are really good at reviewing the survey to see if it can be reused or not. Um, depending on the, the age of the home, really doesn't matter, but the age of the survey does. So if, if the survey was done back in the early 80s when they were literally drawn out, mm -hmm. that may have been copied eight or ten times or may not be an original. If they can't read all the numbers on it, they're not going to be able to accept it. You have to get a new one. So. Um, depending on how quick um, somebody gets that turned in, Jason and I do that very, very quickly on the front side to make sure that's not an issue. But usually it's something similar to that that causes a day or two delay, and it's, I mean, it's, we just ask you to be flexible on that. So we'll schedule a closing date and time. My preference on closings is before lunchtime, just because um, if something needs to change, if there's a clerical error or something that's noted, we can usually still get it done on the same calendar day. Um, title companies usually prefer to close. Normally, they most of them ask for the latest closing time they normally want to schedule is 3. Some of them will do 4 p.m., but then you get into the cutoff of the wires going out and whatever else as far as finalizing it. And it's, um, you know, that's going to lead into obviously closing and funding. Um, but I always, I, I try and shoot for some time in the morning for a closing just because it gives us a little bit of a buffer zone with the same calendar date. Um, and we then, have a Facebook question on uh, closing. Uh, how long is TDCU's closing process compared to other vendors? Okay, so I'm, I'm thinking you're asking how long is this entire process from the time we became a real live mortgage application for regulatory purposes? And, they, and I think you said the question is compared to other lenders. Um, you know, obviously I don't work for other lenders right now. Um, I have friends and family in those other ones, but uh, TDCU is one of the fastest um, that I've ever seen in the industry. Um, you know, 25, 30 days, all day long, no problem. Um, some of the other lenders, they're going to want 45 days to close. Um, so, yeah, 25 days all, all the time. Okay, good question. Thank you. All right, so <laughs> closing and funding, um, do you have any more on that? Um, well, I mean, it's, so it's important to understand that closing and funding are very similar, but they're different. So if you go to closing at 10 a.m., that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get your keys at 11 a.m. Um, on the purchasing side, depending on what type of loan, how many questions you have, it normally takes between 45 minutes to an hour and a half to do the closing. Um, and there's different factors that weigh into that. Um, <clears throat> hopefully it funds right away. Sometimes there's a delay. Sometimes... Um, the wires don't get initiated as, as quickly. Um, sometimes even the buyer may forget or miss the cutoff the day before for their down payment. I think um, we should talk about that a little bit as well. Sure. Um, money, the amount of money you need to bring to closing, okay? Back when we um, are scheduling the closing, and Joe Mark mentioned that by regulatory purposes, our closing department is going to uh, send you by email a Closing disclosure. We call it a CD. Everything we have has acronyms. A closing disclosure is a CD. So we get that out by law three business days before closing, as he mentioned. On there, we'll have the amount needed for closing. Okay. It won't be quite to the penny, but it'll be within hundred dollars or something. So at that point, now you, that number is still matching everything we've done already. There's no surprises going on here. Okay then typically um, that gives us the regulatory piece where we can actually go to closing three days later. Um, within those three days, the closer will then send you a final closing disclosure with down to the penny in order to bring to closing. Now, um, I'm guessing most or all of you here are members of TDCU. Um, those that are members, um, we're, we can actually um, wire the money for you out of your TDCU account. Um, those non-members, um, typically uh, cashier's checks um, is, is what they want to see. 
Um, they, they will take some wires, but you'll want to be very in tune with the title company when wiring money these days, just to be on the safe side. So the final dollar figure to the penny will be disclosed to you well in advance for you to, to go get the cashier's check or get the money wired so that when closing occurs. So your money goes in, our money's in the wire, is in, in the, at the title company. The title company's responsibility is the derivative we've mentioned as well as disperse all this money out to the seller, to your insurance agent that we've had up here earlier. Your, your funds are all include that at closing. You're not paying your insurance at that time. It's all part of the closing, okay? So there's, there's the closing and funding, there's quite a bit that goes on with that mm -hmm. um, behind the scenes. So the, um, and it, it's real good to, I mean, I always check with each specific title company to make sure how they want their money. Some of them want the cashier's check, some of them only want wires now because you know, if there is fraud that goes on with fake checks, whatever else, it's not very common, obviously, but we want to make sure we get the money there the way the title company wants it. Um, once they receive the funds from everybody, they, they pay out to basically everybody that is involved in a matter of minutes. So they're going to pay off the seller's current mortgage. They're going to take care of your insurance for you. Mm -hmm. They're going to bring in your loan amount, set up all that, take care of uh, basically all the money that goes out. So if there's any kind of an HOA transfer fee, if there's anything, it's all handled for you essentially. Um, once all that's done, they will call uh, myself and Jason and say, hey, we have everybody's money, everything's all funded, it's, you know, it's okay to disperse keys, etc. cetera. Um, and once you have the keys, man, you've made it. I mean, you're at the finish line. It's, yeah. uh, it's a done deal. You can relax. There's not going to be any more questions. You know, you're, you're done at that point. So That's when you call your family and friends and go to moving day. <laughs> That's right. So, so. All right. Uh, get, wrap it up through, um, you know, through moving day. It's not, I've had people show up in a U-Haul at the title company. Um, you know, they're a little excited. <laughs> <when they're laughs> <doing it. laughs> so, um, but uh, that's that's pretty much a summary. So Kimberly's going to go over a couple of the forms that we have in your folder for you, so you'll know what you're looking at when you see that. I just want to thank you guys for coming and listening to everybody talk, insurance, everybody. Um, there are a couple things in here, obviously, um, a bunch of things about your loans and things to go through. Everybody's talked a lot, so go home, process, and then also just look through the things that are in here provided for you. Um, one of the things I want to point out too is um, just your purchasing pathway. Kind of put this together to kind of basically goes through everything we talked about um, today with you, just be more of a read and read again and um, understand a little bit more. Um, and then also a moving checklist I provided for you um, goes by months, weeks, up to days. Just some things you forget about um, going through all this process and you're dealing with all the money and getting all the forms that you need to get from there, so you kind of forget about some of the things that you also need to take care of to just kind of prepare yourself. Um, and those that are tuned in on Facebook, um, contact any of us. I know all of our information is going to be posted on there for you. Um, so don't forget, if you have any more questions, we can all answer through Facebook, through email, text, calls. I really appreciate you guys for coming. All right, that's good. And there's also more goodies over here. Um, TBCU has provided refreshments and then all the insurance companies have their baggies as well. We pick up a baggie and make sure you got one. Okay, good. All right. Any more questions here from the audience? Any questions from Facebook Live? Anyone? Anyone? All right. Thank you, Facebook Live, for being with us tonight. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you all. Bye-bye. One sorry. more question. Sorry. I just wanted to be really clear on the uh, money on the buyer's side, everything that the buyer pays for as opposed to selling. So the question is, everything that the buyer pays for versus mm -hmm. the seller. Well, we can talk about what's a customary, kind of normal. Yeah. Um, normally, the seller is going to cover your title insurance policy. That's one of the more expensive closing costs. Um, I think the seller, if, if, if it's in the contract for the um, home warranty, they'll cover that. And then that's pretty much it. So, well, on the, on the closing costs. Yeah, yeah. So on the seller side, they, they cover any broker or agent fees that are involved with the transaction. Um, traditionally, they cover that. They, you know, the owner's title policy is, is a pretty stable. All these things are negotiable, but this, I'm just saying what's, you know, more common than not. Um, 
if there's a, a request for a home warranty in the contract, they would take care of that. Um, <coughs> During the contract that Joe Mark's putting together, there's a part of the contract that um, can be entered into as a dollar amount. And I think that's where we're going with this is that um, he could put in there that they pay $5,000, okay? So what happens is at when that closing disclosure is delivered, it does. It, it takes that five thousand and just starts taking away from all the item to use up the five thousand that they're contributing towards the sale. Okay, that's another way. Now, another thing I think about taxes. Okay, um, we're kind of later in the year here, where the seller of the home will give you credit on the final closing disclosure for the exact amount of days that they own that home. Okay, and then um, that way you're getting credit. For the time that they own the home taxes, so that'll also be on there. You also have to cover all your insurance too. Right. You have to have at least a full. If you're asking them, you have to have a full year worth paid up plus so you can make sure the dogs are being escrowed not to be the ones that's a couple months to get to. Right. Mm -hmm. on, on, on the buying side, for sure. Yeah. They're probably going to be fine because that's probably your closing cost that you're going to see. You're paying for your full insurance, homeowner's policy, and full. So. To answer your question better, probably, are you thinking of selling a home and buying another? Is that why you were, why that question came up, or are you just no, kind of? No, I really was thinking, maybe, of uh, buying with, you know, to, to be real clear, because I think that the most important thing for uh, a buyer that we would want to know is how much money is this going to cost me? I mean, you know, you're in a period of mind ahead of time. Right, and that's that's the main reason why, why we've talked about starting with the pre-qualified and the pre because they will issue out an estimated statement for you that says your down payment is going to be X number of dollars, your potential closing costs are this number, et cetera. And then as we're working through the contract and negotiating on your behalf, if we get something that the seller may cover or whatever the case is, we can back those numbers out of that estimate so that you know all along what you're looking expense-wise at. So, yeah. Maybe to answer your question too, is there's three main things in the moment we find a house. It's that earnest money, that 150, 200, whatever it is, has to come out. And then that check for the, um, the earnest money, 1500, the option fee, yep. and then your earnest money. And then you have to pay for inspection, or we you know, advise you to pay for inspection. The, those, are, those are like out of pocket. Those are the main upfront cost, and then the rest of it happens at, at closing. Um, as far as the seller's cost, what they normally pay for, when I go on a listing presentation, I take a estimated closing statement with me. So based off of what I think the home is worth, I will run that and show the seller, you know, I, I can't figure out the exact sales price, but based on the comparables, this is where you may end up in your neighborhood. It normally takes 45 days to sell the house, whatever the case is. I'll put as much of that in there as I can. And then the seller can say, hey, look, this is, you know what, this is potentially what we may walk away with. Um, because it's my goal, whether you're buying or selling, make sure that everybody has a um, very good understanding of what to expect. Um, it's, it's a pretty sad situation that I see more often than not when I go, we're doing more separate closings now, um, but if there's a buyer and seller in the room, I've been in there before representing the buyer and the seller has no idea that there was fees coming off their bottom line because maybe their agent didn't explain anything to them and that's, that's a pretty, pretty bad situation when they're thinking they're going to get this number here, but in all reality, all this else has to come out first. Um, so on the front side, I try and explain all that to the seller so that they know what they're looking at. And then when they get an offer, if it's my listing, <clears throat> I'll rerun that same estimate and say, okay, I'm not telling you to take this offer, but this is what this offer means to you. If you were going to take it, this is what they offered. This is when they want to close. This is what they asked for closing costs. And here's your bottom line so that, you know, in that situation, the seller knows exactly what's going on regardless of what they decide to do. So, all right. Any, any other questions? Facebook Live? All right. No, thank you. Take care, right. everyone. Thank you, guys.